All right, so I am Greg Hogan. I work on infrastructure here at Comma. Um, yeah, let's see if I can figure out this clicker. There we go. All right, let me turn this a little bit. That's better. All right, so who's excited to hear about infrastructure? Wow. I didn't think it would be very many people. That's good. I guess it's a lot of pressure, though, now, if uh, I feel like people expect a lot or something. All right, anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, so the goal of Comma is to solve self-driving car, self cars. Uh, we're going to do it with machine learning. And uh, we're going to need really good infrastructure to be able to accomplish this. We've got to be able to iterate fast. We've got to be able to train models you know, with reasonable speed and so forth. So at Comma, we call everything supporting our customer-facing applications and model training infrastructure. So that's hardware and software. We call it all infrastructure. So what do we need? Uh, well, one thing we're going to need is data. And so luckily, we have thousands of users every day collecting data for us. And somehow, we need to get this data to train models. So uh, we have devices out in the field that have this data. And they upload it to a storage account in Azure. That data, when it comes in, we throw it into a queue. And then it goes into, uh, it, it, it gets picked up, from, things get picked up from that queue from virtual machines that run in an auto-scaling group. And then we do some processing on it and uh, decide what's good for, you know, what, what data do we have, where are we getting that's good for training, um, and we save some metadata about it off. So we want to minimize the cost of processing this data. We get a lot of data, uh, and we don't want to spend a fortune processing it. Um, so what do we do? Well, these cloud storage providers, pretty much all of them now, have this great feature where like, they have all this spare capacity and no one's using it. So they have something called spot instances or low priority VMs. And so you can use their infrastructure that's kind of spare uh, for like 20% of the normal cost. So, but what's the downside of this infrastructure that's like super cheap? Well, they can pull these VMs back anytime they want. When some other customer says, oh, hey, I would like a VM of that size, uh, well, then they kick you off and they give it to someone else. So how do, how do we manage this? How do we keep our processing costs low and keep our latency low? Uh, because we need to get this data processed so that we can give our users access to it, and we want to do it in a timely manner. So what we do is we spin up multiple sizes of these scale sets. Uh, with different CPUs, different memory configurations. And uh, the probability of us losing any one of these scale sets, losing all the VMs in one of these scale sets, is independent of the other scale sets that are the same size. So what's the probability of us losing all of them? Well, it's exponential as we add another scale set of a different size and another scale set of a different size. So, uh, so that's why this works, um, and, and it works really great. So now that we have all this data, uh, we need to be able to use it for different things, like some different applications that we have. Um, the data isn't public, but like the API we use for our applications, we made it public so that people can get their own data. Um, so you can go to api.comma.ai, for example, uh, and you can see the documentation so that you can, you know, if you wanted to, build your own application on top of your data. We also have some nice tools that uh, have been in some of the other presentations. Cabana, for example, it uses that same public API. Uh, Connect, or it was previously Explorer, uh, it also uses that same public API, and this gives you, you know, nice dash cam type functionality for reviewing your data. And another nice thing that we offer people um, is what we call an SSH proxy. So 
we sell a dev kit, and uh, it would be nice if you could you know, SSH into your device from anywhere if you're doing like development type stuff. Uh, but normally, like if your cell phone is on a cell network, mobile data, they block port 22. Uh, because there's actually been problems where like people accidentally leave port 22 open and then people can get into devices because you know, they did shady like the same username and password for every device or something like that. So how do we get around this? So what we do is the devices, whenever they have an internet connection, they open a WebSocket connection to a server that we have uh, in Azure. And then when you want to connect to your device, what you can do is you can SSH into the hostname ssh.com.ai from your computer, and your username is your device ID, and you have to present a public key that you had previously already set up on your device. So then what our proxy server here does is it, bring, it looks at your connection and it says, oh, you're trying to connect to this device. Let me go ask that device what public keys are allowed to connect to it. It pulls those public keys. It then sees if you can successfully authenticate against the proxy server with that public key. And then if you can, then it lets you tunnel an SSH connection through the proxy server, through the WebSocket, into your device. And then the device just, I mean, it's literally port 22. Like, then your, your device then is going to authenticate again with that same public key. Um, this is like what they call like an SSH jump server. Uh, we just tunnel it through a WebSocket so that everything's making incoming connections. And it doesn't matter if you're on a mobile network with your device where port 22 is blocked. Um, so in case anyone's wondering, Comma doesn't have SSH access to anyone's device. Uh, SSH is off by default on your device. You have to turn it on, and then you have to set up you know, what public keys you want uh, to have access to your device. Um, and all the authentication you know, happens on the device. We can't, it's, you know, the way public key authentication works is you know, even though the traffic is passing through our proxy server, it's still encrypted with your keys, and so we have no way to be able to look at any of that data. So all of that uh, infrastructure we just talked about, uh, it's hosted in the cloud. And it's hosted there because, you know, the cloud has these great features, and we're willing to pay a premium for high reliability, scalability, and availability. All right, so we got a little sidetracked there. We're talking about, you know, training models. Uh, but we needed some good stuff to, uh, we needed a good pipeline of data coming in, and, and you know, that's kind of, all the stuff that supports that. So let's get, back to, let's get back to training models. So what kind of hardware do we want to train models? Do we want to run it in the cloud? Well, the most important thing to us is that we maximize the compute we get per dollar we spend on that infrastructure. And we can tolerate some failures. The cloud is great you know, because it's so scalable and reliable. But for research, you know, we don't really need all of that. There's a lot of data that we can like regenerate if we, if we needed to and so forth. Um, so what meets these requirements? So it turns out that refurbished equipment running in a garage actually is it's really cheap and it, and it works really well. So if you consider the cost of just the cloud data storage, for all the data that we hold for, for doing model training. Um, the cost of that cloud storage that we would need to have equivalency, uh, we would recoup all of our costs in 10 months buying all the hardware that we've bought. So like our, our return is so, is so good. Like this here is a DGX Superpod. This thing's brand new probably. Looks super clean and nice. So let's, let's see if our servers look like that. <clears throat> okay. So we started an office in San Francisco, and at some point, someone bought a rack and put some servers in it. Uh, and then that rack turned into two, and then it turned into three. And 
And the power wasn't very stable in the house at this point. We had like a lot of voltage swinging going on. Uh, when like GPUs would hit really hard uh, model training or you know running the SegNet or something. And so we needed a lot of power conditioners. So you can kind of see here our ratio of, you actually can't see uh, the GPU servers here, but you can see our uh, kind of ratio of uh, power conditioners to actual you know, use of compute. It's kind of, it's kind of high. Um, another funny story, so we actually, uh, when we were in this house, uh, something kind of weird happened. Uh, we had like a water leak at some point, and so they were in the front yard digging up the water line. And all of a sudden, like, the two phases on the house, one went up to, like, 300 volts, and the other went down to, like, 100 volt, 100 volts. And we're like, what the, what in the world is going on? Uh, and so all of a sudden it went away, and it kind of correlated to when they buried this, this water line, this copper water line that was going into the ground again. And so I take a clamp on amp meter, and I'm going around the house. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what the heck is going on? And I clamped this clamp on amp meter onto this copper pipe going into the ground. It read 30 amps. 30 <laughs> amps of power getting dumped into the ground through the copper pipe. So why is this happening? Well, it turns out that on the pole, not even in the house, the pole where the house gets power, the, uh, the neutral was completely disconnected, like corrosion. <laughs> had completely electrically disconnected the neutral. So when you have an imbalance in between your two phases, where does the difference go? It goes through the neutral back to the transformer. Well, we had no neutral. So what's the next best thing? Well, it might have actually been the copper water pipes, which the ground is, is clamped to, through the ground to the neighbor's house, which also has the neutral clamped, or the ground clamped onto the copper wire. And you know, in, in your panels, the neutral and the ground are, are bonded together in your main panel. So that's why we had 30 amps of power going down into the ground. <laughs> so, uh, so that was pretty funny. Uh, you know, I don't know how, gosh, I remember just like scratching my head for days, like really frustrated, like what the hell? We got these nice power conditioners and all this weird stuff's going on. But anyway, <laughs> it's a good, good story. I'm glad we, glad we figured it out. Um, so, right now we're running these servers in this garage in the basement, and eventually the garage that the servers are running in, well, the garage doesn't have enough power anymore to power these servers. So we need to find power somewhere else. So what do we do? Well, there's more circuits in the basement, so we start pulling power from other circuits. But eventually, the, uh, the bottom floor of the house doesn't have enough power. So, well, kitchens have a lot of circuits, a lot of 20 amp circuits. So you can kind of see here, there's a, there's a black thing going down from that window to the garage. That's a bundle of really heavy duty extension cords uh, powering some of our servers in the garage. Uh, we also had a bunch of 3D printers in there too, so that didn't, that didn't help. Uh, those things, the, the heated beds can obviously draw quite a bit of current too. Uh, but so, you know, this can't go on forever. The house wasn't going to have enough power. We really wanted to buy more servers. Like, we're, we always want to buy more servers. Um, and so, we get a real office. We moved to San Diego. We got a big garage. We got three-phase power. Everything's great. Well, when you're using 60 kilowatts of power, you're generating a crap ton of heat. And you got to get rid of that heat somehow. So there's a few ways you can do this. You know, the obvious one is if you run a data center, you, you have like climate control, right? You got HVAC. Well, air conditioning is really expensive if you want to, you know, get rid of 60 kilowatts of heat. So, you know, what do we do? Well, we're in San Diego. The temperature doesn't swing that much, right? It doesn't get super hot here. So we put in two 10,000 CFM, 
two 10,000 CFM fans. We got an intake fan and an exhaust fan. Put in a partition for separating the hot and cold aisle of the servers. Uh, and you know that, that worked pretty well. But then we had another problem. Uh, so it turns out that uh, we started seeing signs of corrosion, like this fried capacitor. This is a backplane on the server. So there's a lot of dirt here, uh, and we got this capacitor that's fried. So what's going on here? It turns out there's this thing called equilibrium moisture content, or EMC. And it's really important. So um, it's basically, so equilibrium moisture content is the amount of moisture that a material will hold, and it's neither releasing moisture into the air or sucking moisture out of the air. So like, there's no such thing as dry or wet. There's, there's a continuous scale. And depending on what the relative humidity and the temperature together are determines what this equilibrium moisture content is. Uh, so you got to manage this, or else uh, you know, all that dirt from this dirty garage, you know, it's, it, it holds moisture. And that's, that, that was kind of a problem. So you, to manage this, basically, uh, you can look around and like find numbers. Uh, you want to keep it below this 10.5% number. Generally, if you go above that, it's considered corrosion, or it's considered a corrosive environment. If you keep it below, you're in good shape. Um, so, so how do we stop this corrosion? Um, so it's, it's this scale, right, where like as the relative humidity goes up, the temperature goes down, the, uh, the EMC goes up. So how do we keep the relative humidity down and the temperature up is the question. Or how do we, how do we keep this number low? And so, you know, the, the obvious solution here is, again, air conditioning. But that's kind of expensive. Do we really want to do that? <laughs> no, we don't. There's a cheaper solution. So instead of sucking moisture out of the air, or I'm sorry, instead of lowering the relative humidity by taking moisture out of the air with something like air conditioning, we can just raise the temperature. So when we buy these used servers, they've got like metrics you know, from whoever owned them last. So this here is a picture of, you can see the, the black and gray on the far left here is what temperature the server was running at before we got it. And then there's like a dead zone where it wasn't on because no one owned it. And then you know, the temperature after we start running it. So you know, they ran it around 21 to 23C. It sounds like a nice life for a server. Uh, but then, you know, we get it, and it runs like 35C to 42. So, uh, you know, we, our, our, our goal is to keep it under 43C. 43C is 109.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, we kind of we kind of abuse them. But everything in the server can handle this. Like the the lowest temperature, I think, of anything, the, like the lowest operating temperature of anything in the server is probably the spinning drives and the ones that have spinning drives, and that's like 55C. So, you know, 43 is not that bad. So we also decided, you know, this is, this, this is a lot of dirt. Maybe we should try to keep some of the dirt off the servers. So now we put this filter material just right on the front of the servers because, you know, to get a 10,000 CFM fan with a filter on it is like 10 grand or something crazy. So that seems stupid. We've got all these servers. They've got all these fans in them. The only place they take in air is right on the front of them. So we just throw the media filter right on the front of it. Uh, we also decided, you know, we want these backplanes to last a while. They're still going to get dirty. And this, this isn't going to filter out all the dirt. This garage is, you know, pretty dirty. So we put like 10 layers of conformal coating on our backplanes. And we use like a potting compound to uh, seal up these exposed leads on these drive connectors. This is, this is a picture of a backplane that's been all sealed up so that you know, we don't have this uh, corrosion problem. And th this is really only a problem in the front of the server because the temperature needs to be kind of low for the EMC number to be high. So in the back of the server, it's always really hot. But in the front of the server, that's where you're going to have problems. And so, you know, that's kind of what we saw. The back planes, you know, catch a lot of dirt, and it's the coolest part of the server, generally. 
All right, so what do we have in these racks? We've got 1,888 CPU cores, 72 GPUs, two petabytes of spinning drives, and 516 terabytes of solid state drives. We've got basically two classes of servers. We have servers that we use as compute nodes, and we have servers that we use as trainers. So here's what our compute nodes look like. This is a rack of them. Uh, every one of these servers has 10 spinning drives. They're 1U servers. Uh, they were new back in like 2015 or 2016. Um, but they work great. We have three racks of these. Here's what our trainers look like. They're also old servers. Uh, basically, you know, lots of RAM, lots of GPUs, and lots of network bandwidth. We also buy used networking uh, equipment. So it's, it's, it boggles my mind how cheap you can buy this stuff. Uh, this is a 100 port that you're looking at here, this picture, 100 port 64, or I'm sorry, 100 gigabit 64 port switch. This switch costs us $2,800. That's 6.4 terabit of switching capacity. And I remember at one point I bought a new Netgear 48 port switch for comma. And that Netgear switch was only 10 gigabit, 48 ports. It was almost $4,000. <laughs> and I can get a 64 port 100 gigabit switch for $2,800. Yeah, $2, so we have multiple of these. Uh, and then we also have an InfiniBand switch for the, for the trainers to get even higher network bandwidth between them. So how do we use this hardware to train models? Uh, well, we've got all this data, and now we need really high bandwidth, high performance file system for the different servers doing the different tasks to pull the data and work with it. So originally we used NFS for a long time, and yeah, that doesn't scale. Uh, it's pretty bad. So we looked around at distributed file systems that existed, and everything was way more complicated than what we needed. Um, it's crazy how like complicated like Ceph is and all these things. So we built this this uh, we built this distributed file system called MiniKey Value. Uh, it's open source. It's on GitHub. It's less than a thousand lines of code. Uh, it has an HTTP interface, you know, kind of like S3. Uh, and uh, the, one of the reasons it's it's such a small amount of code is because it, we use Nginx for the volume servers to serve up the files. So. Um, so, how, so let's take a look at this. This is kind of a, a picture of kind of like our uh, infrastructure in our garage. And uh, let's see how, for example, you write data into mini key value. So the first thing that happens is the client trying to write a file into, the, into mini key value makes a put request to the mini key value master. The mini key value master then takes that and uh, depending on how many replicas you want, it then makes that many copies across that many machines. So each of these machines are called, we call them volume servers. So there's the master handling the requests initially, and then there's volume servers that hold the data. Um, so these are our machines with you know, 10 spinning disks each, and basically if you have uh, three copies of your data, it's gonna put a copy on each of the, uh, on each of the servers. So um, if you've got three copies, then you know you can lose like one or two entire machines and you haven't actually lost any data. Um, so that's what we use for our raw driving data. Uh, we use three copies, and so that's how you put data into many key value. Uh, the, the volume servers are getting your Nginx, so basically it's just using you know, HTTP requests passed through to Nginx to uh, write out these copies of the data. So now how do we read data back out of mini key value? Say you wanna, say you wanna pull a file and you wanna like run through the video or something like that. So the first thing that happens is the client again makes a get request, it hits the master. The master then looks at the, it looks at the list of, it maintains an index of the list of volume servers that have the data that, it, that you're trying to request. 
It then picks one randomly, and it returns a 302 redirect to you. So then what does the client do? It just follows that redirect, which you know, hits an Nginx server directly that is hosting the files, and just returns it. And so uh, our master is really simple. Like our master is just a level DB index of all the files on all the servers. The files on the servers are actual like physical files, and they have a name that is the hashed key or the base64 encoded key. So like if our master ever disappeared for, like if our master ever failed for some reason and we lost our, we lost our index, we can actually regenerate the data that was in the master very easily just by spinning through all the files, unbase64 encoding them and repopulating that, that master index. All right, so now that we have a high, uh, a high performance distributed file system, um, let's, let's run some tasks that are going to generate our ground truth uh, for training models. So the way that this works is um, a workstation. Uh, we have some software libraries custom built that we have that we use for submitting jobs to, our, to all of our servers. And uh, basically it builds up a list of tasks. Uh, each task can run independently in parallel of all the others. Uh, and it kind of manages, it manages dependencies and, and gets results and so forth and submits them as, as, uh, as they can be submitted. Um, so then all of these, um, these three racks of compute nodes that we have, they're all pulling tasks out of, out of consumers. And they then read data from our spinning drive mini key value. We have a mini key value instance that's just spinning drives. They then, uh, you know, to run tasks, they need to read data from, you know, like so let's say the raw driving data that we have. And then they write the results back out to the mini key value instance that is uh, solid state drives. So that way, like our model trainers have like really high IOP, really high bandwidth. Um, file system that they can pull uh, the data from for training. So let's see here. Go back one. There we go. So our spinning drive array here, um, it's 40 machines. It has 400 spinning drives spread across 40 servers. And so that's our two petabytes of storage that we have, uh, which is about 10 million minutes of driving data. Uh, and then our, our mini key value solid state drive, or mini key value that's you know, all solid state drives is 20 machines, um, and that's our 516 terabytes of SSD. All right, so now we've got our ground truth generated. Um, let's train a model. So how does that work? So we have 10 servers here that are model trainers. Um, we can run a lot, we have 10 of them, so we can run a lot of experiments in parallel. Each of these model trainers has a 100 gigabit ethernet uh, network connection to one of those 100 gigabit switches. And then uh, one of our racks has another 400 gigabit per server hooked into an, Infini an InfiniBand switch so we can do things like RDMA uh, and do like parallel uh, training and so forth. Let's see, I went too far. Okay, so when we kick off uh, model training, uh, it's, it's something that's running on one of the GPU servers. This is our mini key value SSD instance. The, you know, it pulls data, from, pulls data from there. Each of those machines has 20 gigabit of network connectivity, so it's a really high bandwidth. Um, And then uh, each epoch, it uh, generates some metadata, and it writes it out to uh, what we call our, our reporter server, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So you repeat this, you repeat this about 1,000 times, uh, and then we've trained a model. So 
So this is our reporter server. This is what it looks like. Um, one of the screens in our reporter server. Uh, it's kind of like it's kind of like TensorBoard. Um, it has a lot of charts and images. Uh, it's pretty simple. Something we custom built just to hold all of our experiments. Um, we looked around kind of at like the other options that were open source and available and free, and um, they didn't really have all the features we wanted. Um, so that's why we ended up building something custom. Um, and it really wasn't like this wasn't a big project at all. Um, another another screenshot from our model reporter. This is um, this is an example of like where you can pull up worst losses for an epoch. And so that's pretty much all the infrastructure that we have that we use for uh, training our models. Um, so. Our user base grows like 50% every six months, at least on average. Um, we, we need to scale up a lot of our infrastructure as we, you know, it doesn't take us too long to grow another 10x at that rate. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. You know, there's always ongoing work to really scale things up. Um, we want to build a 10x larger data center. So we've got all kinds of exciting things we would love to do to, uh, you know, uh, train on maybe 10 million segments uh, of driving data and running the ground truth for that it takes a long time. Would take a long time on our on our current setup. Um, so um, let's see. So yeah, if you uh, I don't know, you think this stuff is exciting to you? You think? Uh, uh, you think that's cool stuff? Uh, we're hiring, and so uh, it looks like I'm pretty much out of time here. But uh, yeah, I'll be around and uh, find me if you have any questions. <laughs> oh. Hang on. If we have, oh, I thought I was gonna be really cool, and I didn't get any questions. Like, like, does Steve Jobs take questions after he like <laughs> talks? I don't think he does. Does he? Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm in the back on the first floor. Hello. I I can't see anyone. What's up? Oh, hey. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the mini key value presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I, I, okay, maybe I maybe there's not a good answer to this, but like, how did that not exist? Like, there I must mean, be like other companies trying oh, to build yeah. their own training pipelines and their own data centers on. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty the functionality is pretty limited, right? Like, a lot of people want you know like super high availability and uh, uh, you know more. A lot, a lot, you know, kind of better insur assurances than what we have. We've got we, MiniKey Value has this kind of bottleneck for writing data, which is the master. We've got, a, I've got ideas how we can improve that. Like, we, we've got some pretty specific. Uh, how do I say this? We don't need a lot of these crazy features that these other distributed file systems have. So, like for example, our data, our, our MiniKey Value instance that has three copies of the data. Uh, this master is a bottleneck. All the writing goes through the master right now. It manages getting three copies out to three of the volume servers. So like that, that can obviously be a bottleneck, right? So other distributed file systems are like, oh, well, that's, that's never going to work, right? But for us, it actually does. Because the amount of data we take in, like we take, we, we don't, if we could generate, like we have 1,000 users, if we could generate 10 times as much data today, would that actually be good data for us? The answer is no unless we have 10x more users too. Like we need diversity in our data. So our data comes in slowly. And we don't need a ton of bandwidth to this uh, mini key value instance that has a bunch of redundancy. But on the other hand, we do need really high write performance for our mini key value solid state instance, right? Because that's where our, our reporters read data and, and write uh, well, we need to be able to like massively write out our ground, our ground truth from all of our 
from all of our consumers. And so uh, there's a solution to this because, there's a good solution to this because we don't need multiple copies of that data. We only need one copy. Because if we ever lose a drive, that's like a small portion of our data, number one. Like, we don't really care. But number two, if we did care, we can just rerun the ground truth and regenerate it. If we have a disk fail, like, like who cares? We'll replace it and we'll rerun ground, you know, the ground truth for that. So what we can do is we can actually use redirects to write data. Uh, if all the master is doing is doing redirects, like, it's, it's you know, we don't have any performance problems. Um, so when you only have one copy of your data, like our mini key value SSD instance, your writing can be redirects too. You don't have to funnel all your data through, through the master. We could also do like crazy stuff like have the client write out multiple copies, but like, again, like, you know, when, when it's, uh, when you're really focused, uh, when, you, when you understand your own problem well and you're really focused, you can, you know, come up sometimes with really simple solutions to those things. Thank you. That gives me a lot of insight. Yeah, no problem. You mentioned the humidity is a problem. In San Diego, it's about 60% on average. And, and would it be beneficial to move the compute cluster to somewhere like 29 Palms where the humidity is half? Uh, I don't know. Like, why do I care if I run my servers at 43C? Is there, are, do, do servers have, I don't know, is anyone like advocate, advocating for server rights? Like, do they, do they get, like, is there, is there what is it, like, uh, child, uh, Whatever, you know, like children can't work in like hot conditions. We're gonna have that for servers someday, too. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it would have, we wouldn't have had this problem. That'd be nice, but uh, it's kind of like, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, what's been your largest challenge in terms of growth and scalability of this hybrid cloud environment? And then also, a uh, second question is, why did you decide Azure when there's more mature cloud environments out there like AWS? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, I got answers for those things. So the biggest challenge, I think, in scaling any of this stuff is like finding simple ways to do it that doesn't require us to hire like a team of people to manage it, right? Like, like why do we care that mini key value is under 1,000 lines of code? We care because like, George wrote it, I can sit down and look at it and like fix bugs in you know, sometimes a matter of minutes. And, and, and you know, I, can, I, can, I can read the whole code base in like an hour, right, and understand everything that's going on. And so, uh, you know, finding good solutions to these problems is, is uh, uh, you know, less code is always better. And uh, I think a good example is we used to spend a lot of money processing, transcoding video, processing video files as they were uploaded to us. And, you know, we were doing this, and I'm always trying to figure out how do we lower our, our cloud spending, and I'm like, well, this is obvious. Like, it should happen on the device. Why are we transcoding in the cloud? So, you know, that's what we did. We didn't, like, build some crazy stuff to, like, do caching and be smart about oh, someone requested the first video of this file, let's start transcoding it, and then the second and the third and the fourth one minute segment, you know? You could go really complicated and build something that probably works really well, but, you know, finding a simple, you know, that's, that's like writing a lot more software and, and, you know, scaling that thing sounds like a nightmare and, you know, it's still probably kind of crappy. So, you know, it's that, you know that's, the real, that's the real challenge, I think, you know, finding a way to do it really cost effective. Second question you asked. So why are we in Azure? So we, we, uh, we, we weren't always in Azure. I don't think I've ever really told anyone this story. So before I started at Comma, everything was in AWS. And why were we in AWS? Well, the reason we were in AWS was because uh, if you run a startup, these cloud providers, they'll give, you, they'll give you so much money. Yeah, and why do they give you all that money? Well, they give you all that money because you know, uh, if, you, if you build this really expensive system with all that, those free credits that they give you, well, you've got to keep paying for it when the credits run out. Uh, you know, even if they give you hundreds of thousands of dollars, it comes with an expiration also. So if you don't spend it really fast, it's, it's like they incentivize you to spend the money really fast because it expires. And then once it expires, well, how much is your cloud bill every month now? And you've got to start paying that. So we got, I don't even know how much money we got from AWS. That money ran out. 
So we shopped around. <laughs> we said, who else will give us free money? <laughs> so number two was Azure. And I want to say they gave us $360,000 of credits. That was also a little bit before I started. And after I started, um, after I started, um, I needed to transfer this subscription to my email address. I'm like, this will just be so much easier, so I'm going to do it. Well, it turns out Azure's ridiculous. You have to, th like, they can't transfer a subscription. They have to cancel your sponsorship with all these credits, and then they have to set up a new sponsorship with the new email address. So, guess what happened when they set up the new sponsorship after we spent most of our money? We started back over at $360,000. <laughs> I didn't complain. Actually, there's a little more to the story than that. Actually, what happened was they, so they, they did it, and we didn't have enough money. I'm like, what the heck? You guys are screwing us over. They're like, oh, no. Oh, no, we'll fix that. Yeah, they fixed it. <laughs> so anyway. That's why we're in Azure. So we, we didn't, we, like, like now we're, you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to run our infrastructure in a way that's you know, maintainable. And so you know, we just, now we're just decreasing our costs. Um, it worked. We paid them now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, awesome presentation. Uh, really love your passion about the subject. Um, question. Thanks. Um, what about like backup? And what, what is like your DR plan? Do you have one? Uh, for what, right? Like for, for the data that we use for training, uh, there is no, the, the disaster recovery is bottlenecked by how fast we, we're like worst case, it's bottlenecked by how fast can we collect new data from our users, right? So uh, we back up some data, like, like our reporter server, we send it, you know, to like cold storage or whatever, inexpensive storage in Azure. You know, we run on-prem the reporter, just like the, the trainers and everything. Uh, in the cloud, you know, it's just kind of the same thing. We, uh, one of the first things I worked on was, you know, really making everything infrastructure as code, deploying things in an automated way. Uh, so, you know, a lot of our disaster recovery from like an infrastructure perspective, not from a data perspective, is uh, you just redeploy, you just redeploy things. And, you know, I'm, I'm huge on putting everything in scale sets, you know, so, it, like your recovery is built in, right? Like every time you scale up, you're practicing your recovery, which is great. Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned um, uh, the like spot instances and stuff and kind of balancing between instances of different sizes. Can you talk a bit about how like generally particular workloads fit within particular instance sizes? I don't really know what your oh. compute needs are, but how, how do yeah. you balance that out if you have like uh, uh, certain memory compute sort of ratios that you're trying to maintain. Yeah, so uh, one of my goals at one point when I was, uh, one of my first goals at Comma was to get our processing time, like the latency from when we receive a file from a user to when it's available in like Explorer, Connect, Kibana to be under 10 minutes on average for like 99.9% .9 of our data or something like that over the, over the, like over the course of a month. Um, so I worked really hard on that, and I'm happy to say that our data now uh, is processed like on average under 10 seconds after we receive it. Um, and um, so we used to do like heavier stuff, like um, like processing video files and so forth. So you know a lot of the solution to this was was eliminating that stuff, pushing it, you know, pushing some of it back to the device. Uh, using the queue logs for every, like really pushing people hard to use our queue logs for, you know, our processing needs, um, for customer facing stuff, uh, you know, like figuring out what data we can train on. I always, you know, tell people it has to be based on the queue logs because, you know, we don't want to pull the, the, the raw log files to, to figure that stuff out. Um, so we need the long, or the short of this long story is basically we need very small VMs. We, we, we spin up the smallest possible VMs, which helps, right, because uh, when, when, when we're outbid uh, and we lose instances, 
uh, we lose these spot instances, the more cores we're using, the more likely it is that someone is going to steal our VM. Like say, you know, say we use four core machines versus two core machines. Well, if someone needs a two core machine, there's only four cores, well, then we're gonna lose the four core machine. But if we're doing two two core machines and someone needs two cores, you know, we only lose one of them. So we use, we use like the smallest. We, I, I, pick the, I pick the least expensive, um, you know, the least expensive SKUs uh, and um, always do like the, uh, Azure has this great thing where you can run the operating system out of the super fast cache. So then the VMs come up like super, they, they you know, they, we scale up and down really fast. Um, so yeah, we just use, we use the tiny instances and um, yeah, that's all we need because we, we, we really squeeze down the processing as much as possible. Uh, obviously there's very little processing happening if every file we process is done in 10 seconds. Got any more questions? Nice hat. A uh, quick question about infrastructure as code. Do you guys use like a Terraform or Ansible or what does that tech stack look like? Yeah, we use Terraform. Uh, like in my previous job, things were also in Azure and we used to use the, like the ARM templates. I think those are great too, but I mean, if it's, if it's not broke, you don't, you don't change it, right? We've, we just always use Terraform and it works great. Yeah, we, uh, so we use Terraform and then I guess you were asking like Ansible. So we use Terraform and then I like really try to use uh, uh, cloud in it to uh, bring up the VMs. Um, basically, um, I try to keep those VMs as simple as possible. So most of our VMs that run in the cloud, it's a cloud. It, it's uh, it uses cloud in it to install the Azure CLI so that it can do like um, integrated authentication to do things like pull keys for storage accounts that have been given like role-based access. So we need the Azure CLI so that the VMs have access to things. And then, and then Docker. So everything that we run runs in a Docker container. So we just need to basically uh, install Docker in the Azure CLI. Hey, um, so I guess I sort of wonder, in the long run, um, how much data do you guys keep? Like, I guess it sounded like you weren't particularly concerned if there was a case where you have like some video or other piece of data you want to train on and it gets lost because I, I guess one, you can get it back. But like, do you guys store all the video you've ever collected from customers or do you clean it up as time goes along and you like upgrade the cameras and it becomes less useful, et cetera? Uh, we, we don't store all the data that's ever been uploaded to us. We retain the, um, we retain, retain the raw data that we get for only 14 days. Um, because like the data, it, I mean, again, like keeping our cloud bill low, like I mentioned at the beginning, the storage is so expensive. <laughs> like that's how they get you. And you really can't separate things from the storage very well. Like who has crazy high bandwidth for free to you know, cloud providers and then they charge you if you wanna pull data out of the cloud, outrageous rates, like eight cents per gigabyte. So uh, you know, if, they, if they get you hooked into that storage, they, they really got you hooked. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we just keep the data for 14 days uh, because otherwise we'd be, you know, even now, even keeping the data for only 14 days, our storage is by far our biggest cloud expense. Um, and then the lower quality stuff we keep for at least a year. So like if you have Prime, you can, you can watch your uh, low quality video uh, in like Connect. Uh, you should be able to back a whole year. Great, thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, no problem.